I'm Patrick Moore with his observations of the autumn sky at night. Good evening. I'm afraid I've got no good news for you about the ailing Russian space probe Phobos-1, and I'm afraid I've now got to say the dead space probe Phobos-1, because, as you remember, it was accidentally switched off by a faulty ground command, and I'm afraid there's now no hope of getting in touch with it again, which is a great pity, because Phobos itself is a fascinating little world. It's the larger satellite of Mars. It's a chunk of rock rather less than 20 miles across. But I'm delighted to say that all is not lost, because the companion probe, Phobos II, is on its way to Mars now, and is going well, and with any luck at all, should be sending us back interesting close-range information early next year. Mars itself is still fairly high up in the evening sky, below the square of Pegasus, and you can't really mistake it, because it's very bright and very red. Actually, it is going away from us now, but the apparent diameter is still well over 20 seconds of arc, which is pretty big, and a telescope will show quite a lot of detail on it. And there's a drawing I made on October the 7th with my 15-inch reflector. You can see there the red deserts and the dark markings, and at the top you can see the south polar cap that is now starting to break up. And although Mars is getting further away, it's still going to be well-placed for the next few weeks. Uh, Venus, the other inner planet, is a brilliant object in the eastern sky before dawn, and you rarely can't mistake it. It looks almost like a small lamp, and telescopically, it's now rather greater than a half moon. Although, of course, no telescope will show very much on its cloud-covered surface. Also, this is about the best time of the year for seeing little Mercury. And there's um, a picture of Mercury and Venus taken some time ago. Venus, of course, is the brighter, but um, any time between now and the end of the first week in November, you should be able to make Mercury out. Although, of course, no telescope will show much upon it. It's not a great deal larger than the Moon, and it's very much further away. Of the other bright planets, Jupiter is in Taurus, the bull, moving roughly between the Pyades and the Hyades. And again, you can't possibly mistake Jupiter, because it is so very brilliant, actually now brighter than Mars. Telescopically, you can see its dark belts and its bright zones, although at the moment, I'm afraid you can't see the great red spot. And that was a view I had of Jupiter the other night, again on October the 7th, and you can see the place where the great red spot normally is, but it's done one of its periodical vanishing acts. No doubt it will be back. And this is also a good time for seeing the four main satellites of Jupiter, the Galilean moons, which we know are fascinating worlds, even though from the Earth they only look like tiny disks. That leaves the remaining naked eye planet, Saturn, but we've really lost Saturn now in the evening twilight, and we won't see it well again until early next year. Among the stars, Orion now comes into view at a reasonable hour, and is going to dominate the evening sky all the way through winter and early spring. And you'll recognize it easily, with its two brilliant leaders, the red Betelgeuse and the brilliant white Rigel, 70,000 sun power, and also the retinue, Aldebaran, the red eye of the bull, the Pleiades star cluster, Capella almost overhead, the twins, Castor and Pollux, Procyon in the little dog, and the dog star itself in the great dog, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. And Orion really is a superb constellation. Of the other fairly famous group, Ursa Major, the great bear of the plough, is at its lowest in the north, though of course it never actually sets. And from there, you can find the pole star, marking the northern point of the sky, and if you use Mizar, the second star in the bear's tail, the one with the small star by it, and that and Polaris as pointers, you'll find the W of Cassiopeia almost overhead. The main autumn constellation is, of course, Pegasus, and that's near Mars at the present moment, and that is still fairly high up, and you'll recognize it easily. But we are starting to lose the famous summer triangle, made up of Vega in Lyra, Deneb in Cygnus, and Altair in Aquila, the eagle. You can still see it, and of those three, only Altair actually sets over Britain, but nevertheless, um, it's now well past its best. No meteor showers of any importance this month, no eclipses, so let's turn to something else. Over the years, I've had many letters from people who ask me about not only making observations, but also recording them. And I'm delighted to uh, bring back to the sky at night one of my old friends, Paul Doherty, in rather a new role. We know Paul as a brilliant artist, and we've seen many of his impressions. 
Here, for example, is his idea of the surface of the planet Venus as it probably is. And here's an impression of Saturn's rings close up. But what's not so generally realized is that as well as being an artist, Paul is himself an astronomer and a very skilled observer who is actually the assistant director of the Saturn section of the British Astronomical Association. So welcome to the sky at night, Paul. And of course, you've been observing now for a long time. Well, that's right. I started observing in 1957 took an interest in the planets around about 1960 and took a greater interest and in, decided to start observing them in detail, uh, particularly Saturn, once I built a telescope large enough to show me the details. 1957, that was the year the sky at night started and how long ago that seems. Mm -hmm. But when talking about telescopes, I think you and I agree that very small telescopes aren't really very much use astronomically. And I've always maintained that the smallest useful size is uh, a refractor with an object glass three inches across or a Newtonian reflector with a six inch mirror. You can buy smaller telescopes, two and two and a half inch reflectors and three and four inch Newtonians, and they really aren't much use, and I'd far rather have good binoculars. The snag is, of course, that a good telescope costs a great deal of money, several hundred pounds now. And I wonder, Paul, if you had that amount of money, and you were going to get a telescope, and you had a choice between a three inch refractor and a six inch reflector, which would you go for? Well, the telescope with a larger aperture would be much better if you wanted to do serious observations, especially of the planets. Uh, for instance, there's a drawing here which I made with a three inch some time ago of Jupiter. You can see the major belts there okay, but you can see no fine detail. If you compare that with a drawing made with a six inch telescope at about the same time, you can see much more fine detail. And you can actually make timings of those spots and streaks as they pass the center of the disk and actually work out the rotation periods of various parts of, the, of Jupiter and in this way, you can do serious work. Of course, some planets require even larger telescopes than a six inch. I agree on that one. Well, mind you, I've had my three inch refractor now for a long time, and it's done me very well. And at least a three inch refractor doesn't need an observatory if you can carry it about. And with a larger telescope, um, an observatory is not absolutely essential, but it's jolly convenient. I mean, my 12 and a half inch altazimuth reflector is housed in a runoff shed, and that works very well. My 15 inch is in a, what I laughingly call a dome, which really looks rather like an oil drum. And here's the actual telescope itself. And it works very well indeed. But you know, I have had many letters from people who say something like this. I've got a nice house. I've got a flat roof or part of a flat roof. Should I put my telescope or build an observatory on my flat roof? And of course the answer is just not a good idea at all. No, no of course not. There'll be several problems, of course, trying to mount the telescope securely. Uh, you couldn't do that really well on a roof, and all the time that you were walking around the telescope, it would vibrate and spoil the view. By far the worst problem would be the heat that is rising for, through the roof of the house, and this causes a tremendous amount of turbulence in the atmosphere. And we can actually demonstrate this by using an electric fire and having a look at a light source through the fire. You see that it trembles like a jelly all the time. This is because the turbulence caused by the heat you would get the same thing exactly if you had an observatory on a house, and the view would be completely destroyed. You even get that effect sometimes as a planet approaches rooftops of other houses, and usually when that happens, you have to stop observing. Moral, keep your telescope well away from your dwelling house, and neither is it a good idea to try and observe by poking a telescope through a bedroom window, and of course there are other hazards too, quite apart from the heated air. I once dropped an eyepiece 40 feet on the concrete, which did it no good at all. And then, of course, there are other hazards. You know, Paul, I wonder how many times that you and I have been busy making an observation and realise suddenly that we've got to hurry because cloud is coming up. That's right. Usually it's nice to have a length of time to make an observation, about a half an hour, so that you can familiarise yourself with all the detail that you can see. But occasionally that's not possible. Clouds coming up, you probably have five or ten minutes, and it's necessary for you to make a rapid sketch. Uh, as long as you can get all the major features in quickly, as you can see by this drawing of Mars here, which was made some time ago, I didn't get all the fine detail in there. I wanted a, a sketch for that dark spot that you can see at the bottom there, which is an important feature. Oxyopalus. That's correct. And I needed to make a sketch, and it wasn't complete by any means, and I, but at least I came away from the telescope with a relatively good observation. But if you compare that drawing with a drawing made sometime later of a similar area, and where I did have the length of time that was needed, about a half an hour to study, you can see that even though it was made with a smaller telescope, a lot more detail visible, and you've got the luxury of having time to put that detail in. And of course, when you're observing, you want to be really comfortable. Well, that's correct. Uh, it's necessary to train yourself. Uh, I know a lot of people that come along to use my telescope that have never used telescopes before, and they find it difficult to hold themselves steady at the eyepiece even. Uh, they can't even see the, t the planet, let alone detail on it. 
So you need to practice at keeping yourself steady. It's very important to be comfortable at the telescope, even sit down while you're viewing if that's possible. Another hazard, of course, is a dark adaptation of your eyes. I remember only a few weeks ago, I'd been working at my ancient typewriter until about two in the morning and decided to go out and start observing because the sky had cleared. And when I went out, my eyes were dazzled. And although it was, in fact, a bright starlight night, it was some time before I could see anything at all. Well, that's right. I think a lot of people must suffer this problem many times and are probably familiar with it. As you go out of a bright, brightly lit room into a dimly lit room, it takes a while for your eyes to get used to the dim light. In astronomy, we have an extreme case. It can be a half an hour before your eyes are properly dark adapted so that you can see faint things like the faint streamers in comets' tails or very faint stars. And if someone inadvertently puts a light on outside or shines a torch close to your face, then you're going to lose that dark adaption. It's a very valuable commodity once you've built up that half an hour adaption. You don't want to lose it, of course. Because there's a fair, further hazard that you've got to have some kind of a light when you're actually recording oh, right. observations. And a white light is not a good idea. It's far better to have a red light. And some time ago, I acquired, I'm not sure where, I acquired this red torch that I find very useful indeed. It's far better than a white light of comparable power. Well, yes, it and is a white light. also a very good idea to fix um, a red light to a clipboard like this. So you switch that on there, and the red light casts a dim glow over your recording area, and you can record on that. But uh, what I like very much indeed is what I call my night lighter, made for me, actually. And this, in fact, is um, a pen torch. I mean, it's got a pencil in it, and it's got a battery inside. When you press that and write like that, as you can see, the bottom part actually lights up, and you can see what you're doing. And I find that invaluable. Well, the more age you've got, the better the chance that you're going to make an observation. Of course, there are a lot of pressures. You usually find that if you've not got all this to hand, then you're not going to make as good an observation. You need as many aids as possible to make the maximum use uh, of the time that you've got at the telescope. And at night time, make sure you know where everything is. If you put down an eyepiece or put down a recording pad and you've got to switch on a light to find it, then your dark adaptation is ruined straight away. That's right. Now, Paul, a word about seeing conditions. And, of course, people need different things. People like you and me, who are concerned mainly with the moon and planets, we need steadiness, but stellar observers who are straining to see the faintest things they can, they need transparency and not so bothered about steadiness. That's correct. I know that you observe variable stars as well as planets. I observe comets uh, beside the planets. And for the comets, of course, and for variable stars, you need clear, transparent air. But usually the air on those nights is very unsteady. Uh, when you want to look at planets, you need a faint mist, even bordering on a light fog. When you get that sort of condition, the, the, the air is very, very steady, and the planetary detail stands out beautifully. And, of course, um, you wouldn't really make a drawing of, for example, Mercury unless seeing was pretty good. No, that's right. There is a scale that we use to describe the seeing conditions known as the Antoniadi scale. This runs from 1 to 5. 1 is for perfect conditions, uh, 5 is for poor conditions when observing is useless. The drawing of Mercury you've just seen there was made when the conditions were 1 on the Antoniadi scale. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen the faint markings at all. Venus, for instance, you usually observe during the day, and the sun causes quite a bit of turbulence. Uh, that drawing was made when the Antoniadi scale was two. Normally, I wouldn't bother to make a, a drawing if the scale was less than three or four, but it makes making the notes of the scene conditions far easier to put a number down rather than a lengthy description of what the scene conditions are. Well, of course, I know that you're a great observer of comets as well as the planets, and for that, you need more in the way of, trans of transparency. That's right. If you want to see the faint streamers in a comet's tail, then you need clear, crisp, transparent skies, uh, the sort of conditions that are totally useless for planetary observing. And having two subjects means that you make the maximum use of all the clear nights that we get, and the oppressors few. Well, yet another hazard, uh, and that is the post. Never send away an original copy of an observation. I fell into that trap some time ago. Um, I sent away a stack of planetary drawings to the relevant section of the British Astronomical Association, and they never arrived. So nowadays, mm. I don't trust the post. In fact, I, um, I send away only copies, and I put all my originals into an observing book. And in fact, um, I have an observing book for every particular subject. This, for example, um, is my Mars book, and all my Mars drawings are in there, and that's where I keep them. And I've got a book for variable stars, a book for Jupiter, and so on. And I think myself that's probably the best way, rather than jumbling them all up. Well, that's correct. I also keep a book for every observational uh, subject that I cover. Uh, it's an idea I took from you in the first place, in mm. fact. This is my book on comets. All my observations of Halley's Comet are in this book. I've got a book for every planet, of course, in the same way that you do. Coming back to planets, what about the use of blanks? It's not cheating, it's, it's many rather more accurate. Well, it saves a lot of time. Again, it's an aid that you need at the telescope. And a lot of people do take out prepared blanks, and it's a good thing to do. Uh, all the planets are different shapes. Uh, in the case of Mercury, Venus, and Mars, we use a 50 millimeter or two inch diameter circle. 
but of course Mars shows a slight phase at times, and you can predict that phase, so it's a good idea to have a prepared blank to save time. In the case of Mercury and Venus, the phase is never quite predicted accurately, so we need to draw that phase in at the time. Jupiter is a different kettle fish. That isn't quite a circle, it's a little bit flattened at the poles, and as you can see there, if you draw Jupiter on a perfect circle, then your markings are not going to be in the right place, and you can't get an accurate observation. Saturn is even worse. We need a series of blanks for Saturn for every angle of ring tilt. And we usually have a blank for every degree of tilt, from naught when the rings are edge on, right up to 28 when they're wide open. And it is a problem trying to draw those ellipses accurately. Yes, I think if you're not naturally good at drawing, and I admit that I'm not, then Saturn really can be a problem. So I envy you on that one, Paul. Now let's turn over something quite different, and that is the sun. Now this, in fact, is a drawing of the sun that I made on October the 7th, and that shows um, a couple of fairly large sunspots, because the sun is now getting active again. But that drawing was, of course, made by projection, and actually with my small telescope, with my three-inch reflector. I would never use my big reflector on the sun, it would collect too much light. And, of course, once again, let us stress the danger of looking straight at the sun through any telescope or even a pair of binoculars. Well, that's right. Filters are obtainable uh, uh, to look at the sun, and I don't advise that they are ever used. The glass may splinter. Uh, if the glass doesn't damage your eye, then the light streaming through the telescope certainly will, and you won't get a second chance. Now, there's only one golden rule for looking straight at the sun through a telescope, and that is, quite simply, don't. But luckily, the moon is quite harmless. It can, in fact, dazzle you, but it can't do any more than that. But the trouble with the sun is the fact that it sends us so much heat, and the moon's heat is negligible. So the moon is really a magnificent subject. On the other hand, there are some people who um, get it wrong, and I did when I started observing the moon a long time ago. Look, for example, at this lunar photograph. That shows a large area of the moon, and that crater near the top of the picture is the crater Janssen, well over 100 miles across. Now, just imagine you try and draw all that area at one sitting. Of course, you can't do it. You can't make any attempt at it. And therefore, if you're going to make any worthwhile lunar observations by drawing, then you must select a small area and draw that accurately. And bear in mind, too, that as we both know, uh, a lunar crater changes in appearance almost from hour to hour as the sun rises over it and the shadow changes. I've got a series of drawings here made of the lunar crater Aristarchus. And there, to start with, it's half filled with shadow. A couple of nights later, the shadow was decreasing. A couple of nights later, the shadow's almost gone. And then when we come to full moon, the sunlight's coming straight down on it, and uh, there are no shadows at all, and uh, the crater may be hard to identify. And it's quite amazing. Uh, when I began observing the moon, and that's a long, long time ago now, I took an outline lunar map, and I made a, a vow that I would draw one named formation every night, and over a year, I'd make at least three drawings of every one under different illuminations. And I did that, and although the drawings themselves were, of course, no good at all, uh, at least by the time I'd finished, I knew my way around the moon. Well, the moon's a wonderful subject for study. It's not, a lot of astronomers don't bother with it these days because of all the pictures that we've got back now from the moon probes and the fact that men have actually gone there. But it's still a marvellous object to look at and to record, either by drawing or just to look at or photograph. And let's face it, Patrick, we both got into astronomy because we enjoy it so much. And to take pleasure out of recording observations of the moon is a great thing to do. I absolutely agree with you, and I still enjoy doing it. And there's one other thing, Paul, I think we must stress. If you make an observation, and it's going to be useful to other people, there are certain things you've got to add to it. And those are, quite simply, you've got to add the date, the time in GMT, the type of telescope, the aperture of the telescope, the magnification, the name of the observer, and the seeing conditions. And if any of those uh, bits of data are omitted, then the observation is pretty useless. Yes, the value is gone. Yes, and uh, one final thing, uh, don't keep it yourself. Join the society and uh, send your observations in and collaborate with other people. And remember, I think we agree too, that astronomy is still just about the only science where the amateur observer can still do useful work. Yes, indeed. Paul, thank you very much. Pleasure. And don't forget also, it's now newsletter time again. And if you want your newsletter, then, as usual, send your stamped address envelope to Newsletter number 31, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London W12 8QT, or you can always look at CFAX, page 288. Next month, I'll be joined by Dr. Alan Wright, and we'll be talking about radio stars. And until then, from Paul and myself, good night. <laughs>